Hey everyone, just some quick context before we begin today's episode. Today's video contains 10 scary stories that took place on or around the Halloween holiday, but because I know you all enjoy these longer episodes, I have also gone ahead and included an extra 6 scary stories after the 10th Halloween story. As they are bonus stories, do take note that they don't take place on Halloween. So if you want to hear some more Halloween stories, make sure you send in your own story using the user submissions email on screen. That's tcfnarrations at gmail.com. But yes, that's pretty much all there is to that. Let's go ahead and begin with these scary stories, shall we? It was my turn to take my kids trick-or-treating. The previous year it was my wife's, and we trade back and forth every year. My son and daughter are aged 7 and 9. Usually I stay on the street while my kids go up to different houses to collect candy. After about half an hour of walking around, we came to one of the more popular hotspots for candy collecting, a main street in the neighborhood, with lots of really cool decorations and animatronics on people's lawns. So I became a bit distracted and stopped watching my kids closely. At one point, they came back from a house accompanied by another girl about the same height as my daughter. She was wearing a weird homemade mask, like a cardboard cutout or something. My daughter asked me if she could trick or treat with us. So it said sure and we carried on together as a group. I didn't know who the girl was, but I figured she was a friend from school. As we continued, I started to notice a large man trailing us. He was wearing some sort of angry cat mask. It was kind of creepy to be honest. I thought that maybe he was the father of the girl, so I tried to start up some small chat with him. I said something like, nice weather, eh? But he didn't respond. He just stood there staring at me while our kids went up the stairs to the next house. I tried again, asking, Hey, is that your daughter? He nodded, but didn't say anything. I figured he just wasn't in the mood for chatting, so I just stopped trying. We carried on for about another 15 minutes, until suddenly my kids came up to me and said they wanted to go home. They surprised me as we hadn't been out for too long, and their bags were only about a third full. In any case, I agreed, waved goodbye to the man in the cat mask and his daughter, and started on our way back home. The weird thing is that when I glanced back, the man and his daughter were just standing there staring at us. I checked one more time as we turned the corner, and they were still standing there, not having moved at all. At this point, I decided to ask my kids, So who was that girl? My daughter looked up at me with a confused look on her face. She's your friend, my daughter replied. I asked her what she meant. Apparently the girl with a cardboard mask approached them and said that she was a friend of mine. She told my daughter she was too shy to ask me if she could join us to trick or treat and wanted my daughter to ask me instead. I laughed at this story and replied to my daughter, Why would you think she was my friend? I don't have any children friends. What my daughter said next chilled me to my bone. According to her, when the girl with the cardboard mask approached them for the first time, she wasn't wearing the mask, so they were able to see her face. As it turns out, she wasn't a girl at all, but an older woman around my age with wrinkles on her face. But what's even more disturbing is the old woman had started to steal treats from my daughter's bag, apparently when I wasn't looking. This is why they asked me to go home. The old woman was creeping them out and they wanted just to get away from her. I brought my kids home and told my wife what had happened. We made sure to check through all their candy, but didn't find anything suspicious or off. We didn't call the police or anything, since nothing really happened. But thinking back, I kind of regret that decision now. What the heck was that old woman doing? And who the hell was that man following us around? I don't think I'll ever know. I just think it's sick that there are people out there on Halloween hiding behind masks, pretending to be children. I've never really had any experiences that really freaked me out, except this one. I was around 11 years old, and I was with my sister and her friends. We are all girls. They were all around 16 years old, and were taking me trick-or-treating. We were going door to door to get candy and playing with silly string. I kept, however, getting this weird feeling, like I was looking behind me constantly, and I had no clue as to why. Around 9.30pm, I turned around quickly 
and there was a guy dressed up as a clown about two yards behind us. I wasn't really scared about this because I actually like clowns, and since this was the first time I saw him, I figured that he was just trick-or-treating, but he followed us for another hour, never getting candy, and waiting for us at each house we stopped at. At this point, I was stressing and told my sister about the clown. She decided that we should try going a completely different route, and we can see if that way he's still following us. So we all crossed the street, and he followed. My sister absolutely hates clowns, and was freaked out, so she called her dad to pick us up. We continued walking for around 30 minutes, until her dad called us, saying where he was parked. We all started walking fast toward the direction of my dad's car, but that's when the clown ran in front of us and tried to corner us. I think he knew that we were trying to leave. My sister and her friends were freaking out, and me being a naive and outspoken kid, yelled at the clown to leave us alone. I remember that he tilted his head to the side when I said that, kind of like a confused dog. I grabbed my sister's silly string and told the clown that if he didn't leave us alone, I'd ruin his outfit with a silly string. Again, I was a naive kid. I actually thought that he was going to be scared of silly string. The clown, however, didn't back off, so I stringed him all over his mask and costume. While I did this, my sister called her dad again, telling him to hurry up and where we were. The clown struggled to get the string off of his mask so he could see, but we were already running. And my dad came around the corner and we all rushed inside the car. The clown caught up with us, trying to open the car door, but thankfully it was locked. As my dad hit the gas, the clown slammed his hands on the back window. I remember watching him out of the back window, trying to chase the car, but falling. I never figured out what was up with that clown, but there was other reports of a clown with the same description chasing kids in the area. So creepy clown, I hope that that silly string ruined your outfit, and I hope that we never meet again. In my neighborhood, we don't tend to have many trick-or-treaters. I live only 15 minutes or so from the rich part of town, and most kids between the ages of 8 to 14 beg their parents to drive them over, as some people even give away gift cards depending on how generous they're feeling. I just hand out bagged candy from the local Walmart, and so do my neighbors. So all I ever get is the really young kids whose parents take them for the fun of it, and not for the candy itself. This year I got comfy on my couch around 5.30 and waited for the young kids to start knocking. I'm 17 and quite small, but Halloween has always been my favorite holiday and I've been handing out candy for many many years without my parents home. All was going well. And by 7.30pm, most of the traffic had already passed, but I decided to keep my lights on until around 8.30pm just in case anyone came back from the other part of town and wanted to score a few more Kit Kats before tucking in for the night. It was around 8.50 and I was hoping for one more person to knock. That way I could give them the rest of what was in my bowl. I'm a pretty healthy eater and didn't need the temptation of leftover candy. That's when I saw someone peeking through the windows adjacent to my door. My outside lights were very clearly on and it's not like I was sitting in the dark but all the upstairs lights were off, so I didn't think much of it when I walked over to the door. When I opened the door, still, no one had knocked. A very large man, anywhere from 18 to maybe even early 20s, was facing me. He was in some sort of feminine anime costume, and his overall vibe was very, very uncomfortable and off. I grabbed my candy, but I felt too uncomfortable making conversation with him, and offering him the bowl as he was only speaking to me in Japanese. Part of the costume, I guess. And I just really didn't like what was going on. It's hard to explain, but I could just feel in my gut that something was off with him. I handed him some candy and was so nervous that I actually ended up dropping a few pieces, which he very quickly scooped down to pick up and used as an opportunity to stand back up uncomfortably close to me, almost in my doorway. I quickly closed the door, not even saying have a good night or anything like I usually do, and when I started to turn the lock, I saw out of the corner of my eye another man, probably 18 or 19 years old, out of costume, peeking into one of my windows in a room which is further down in my house, 
but still connected to the front area. The man at my front door must have said something to him, because in enough time for me to step back, they both very quickly ran together through my grass and towards the exit of my neighborhood, not stopping at a single other house until they were out of sight. Now, I know this seems very anticlimactic, and nothing actively happened to me, but I've never had someone older than 15 knock on my door in all the years I've lived here, and I have no idea how long they were standing there. So, anyway, random men who peeked into the window of a 17-year-old girl. Let's not meet. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. If you haven't already done so, make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it so you can be notified of any and all future scary stories narration videos coming here to the Creepy Fox YouTube channel. I'm sure you're going to enjoy your stay. Now, let's continue on with these scary stories. Hey all, I'm Mel, 30 years old, a long time let's not meet lurker and I've debated sharing this for a while. A recent post by someone else about attempted kidnapping kind of jogged my memory again, so I figured I'd share my experience. Well, two experiences. The first part I really have no solid recollection of because I was so young, but it's been a story my mom has shared with family and friends over the years, so I've heard about it many times. This would have been in the very early 90s, so I was probably two or three years old. Now I don't remember this specific trip, but I do remember our routine of going grocery shopping since my mom would always stop at Wendy's and get me chicken nuggets to eat in the cart. I will also mention that my mom worked nights at this same grocery store, the now defunct Pathmark chain. Anyway, as my mom was going about her business shopping and I was going about my business tearing up some sweet nuggies, she was approached by an older woman. As I mentioned, my mom also worked here, and while she had the countless regulars that would routinely come into the store, she had never seen this woman before in her life. Now, I don't know if this woman wasn't all there, if she had evil intentions, or it was just plain lonely, but when she stopped at us, it was to ask my mom if she would sell me to her. By her account, my mom said the woman was being dead serious, offering her $10,000 for me. First of all, that's a terrible deal. I'm worth way more than that. Secondly, that's creepy as all hell, and you're weird as shit. Obviously, my mom turned her down, told her off, and quickly got us the hell away from her. She rushed to the manager's office to report what had happened. Remember, early 90s, there's no cell phones. But by the time security and or management went to find her, she was long gone. I don't recall from the retelling of the story if the police were involved. I'll have to ask my mom to see if she remembers, and I don't believe my mom ever saw her in the store again. So luckily I wasn't tossed up on a register conveyor belt and scanned for $10,000. Unless she did sell me, and it turns out my mom isn't my real mom. Plot twist. Experience number two, mid 90s. This one I do remember. My mom took me and my older brother to the mall because my brother was and still is a huge sports fan and they were having a sports card show. If you're unfamiliar, a card show consists of a ton of vendors setting up tables throughout the mall and they sell cards, autographs, jerseys, etc. Anything sports related. Because of this, the mall was a lot more crowded than usual and having the tables all set up sort of narrow the general walking area. So lots of people moving through a tight space. This is an important detail. I also know it was around Halloween because I vividly remember walking with my mom and brother past a Halloween adventure store. My brother had stopped and was looking at something on one of the card show tables. However, I was too distracted by the damn Halloween store because they had all the really awesome masks on this big wall that was visible from outside the store. Mistake number one. I hadn't noticed that by this point, my mom and brother had walked a little further down. Not far, but maybe 15 feet away from where we initially stopped near Halloween Adventure. I guess I was still in my mask gazing trance, in the midst of this crowded and condensed walkway, when I suddenly felt a hand holding mine. Again, I'm still not paying attention. Mistake number two. 
so this hand was pulling me rather briskly in the direction we had come from, which struck me as odd. Why were we going back the way we came when there's stuff we hadn't seen yet? This was the question I intended to ask my mother, finally raising my eyes to look at her. Yeah, not my mom. Instead, when I looked up, it turned out to be some woman that I've never seen before. The creepy thing is that she never once looked down at me. She is holding me by my hand, pulling me away from my mom at a fairly quick pace, and her gaze is just dead set in front of her, like this bizarre look of determination. This is what terrified me and made me realize I had to break loose ASAP. Even more unsettling, as I wiggled my hand free, her expression still never changed. She still never looked down at me, and once I got my hand free, she did not react at all. She never spoke a single word. She didn't even try to get me again. She just kept walking at that same brisk pace, as if nothing ever happened. Everything about her was just so robotic. I ran back to my mom and brother. Again, this wasn't that far away, and it all happened in a matter of seconds, but I was scared shitless. I vaguely remember grabbing my mom and crying. At the time, I just said I was freaked out because I thought I had lost them. For whatever reason, I was afraid of getting in trouble, so I didn't bring up what happened until later. And by that time, what can you really do? It is funny, however. You read all these Let's Not Meet stories, and it sort of has you recalling different unsettling events throughout your life, and maybe remembering things you had long forgotten. You read about stalking and harassment that goes on for years, and it makes you wonder if these experiences are random, or if, for whatever reason, they're all calculated. It's thoughts like this that force me to re-examine both of those events, and it brought me to one terrifying question. What if it was the same woman from before? Right after I graduated high school, I went to our community college, where my best friend at the time and her boyfriend also attended, along with a lot of their friends, who I became acquainted with as well. Fast forward to Halloween of 2010, we took my best friend's little sister and brother out for trick-or-treating, where her boyfriend ended up joining us. We were towards the end of the route, when one of their friends from the college ended up joining us which I didn't think anything about it at the time, other than he gave me weird vibes. Should have been my first clue, to be honest. After we were done trick-or-treating, we brought the kids home to go to bed, but my friends wanted to go do something to keep the night going. You know, since it was Halloween, and in a college town, that's an excuse to party, just like any other day. They decided on going downtown, but I decided since I wasn't feeling well, which was actually true, but I was also the only one with a car and didn't want to be the chauffeur, and went home. A few hours later, I was in bed reading a book. I still lived with my mom and brother, and my phone lit up from a number I didn't recognize. It was the friend that joined us while trick-or-treating. He explained that he got my number from my best friend's boyfriend, and he was concerned that I didn't feel well, and insisted on bringing me soup to feel better. Some sort of red flag went off in my head, and I didn't want this guy to know where I lived, so I said no. My mom was taking care of it, but thank you anyway. He got a little bit pushy, but eventually backed down and proceeded to send me many text messages, mainly about how much fun he had when we were out, and blah blah blah. I later found out he bailed going downtown too because he only wanted to go with me. He then added me to Facebook went through all of my pictures, and liked all of them. Second red flag, being the naive 18 year old I was, I just thought maybe he was being overly friendly and just a little bit weird, so I didn't avoid him or anything at school, since we hung out with the same people. One day when we didn't have school, he texted me asking if I wanted to go to lunch. I should have said no, and I accepted. My logic was I was thinking I was going to get a free meal out of the deal since he insisted on paying and it would be a quick visit. We met at the restaurant and sat down and talked and ate. It was super awkward and then I stupidly mentioned I wanted to go to the mall to get some stuff. He insisted on driving me there and that his mom can move to the back seat. Wait, 
What? Apparently he drove his mom's minivan, brought her with him, and left her in the car while we went on our date. I kept saying that she should come in and join us, and he got really weird about it and said she was napping and she didn't mind waiting. At that point I started getting very uncomfortable. Luckily we were done with our food and I said I needed to leave, thanked him for the food, and got up to leave. He kept saying he's going to meet me at the mall, and I was put in what I felt was a weird position, and I'm not an assertive person, so I reluctantly said okay. We meet at a large store connected to the mall, and I mentioned how I was here to look for a new scarf, and started browsing. He picked out the most expensive one he could find and brought it for me, and basically almost threatened me not to return it. It was then I wanted to be left alone. So I said thank you and I was going to go home now. He insisted on walking me out to my car. We were parked on opposite ends of the mall and his mom was still in the van. And I kept saying that it was okay, I was fine. He was a big guy and even simple walking caused him to break out in sweat. But he wouldn't take no for an answer, so away we went. We passed by another and took a quick peek inside. There were a pair of boots that I very quickly, in passing, mentioned they were cute, but I don't know if I'd wear them. He bought them for me and did the same somewhat threatening not to return them because they were gifts, and you don't return gifts. Like dude, what are gift receipts for? At that point, I got a little firm and told him I wanted time alone, so please don't walk me out to my car. He accepted and went on his merry way clearly happy that he made those purchases to show he liked me. I go out to my car and wait for probably about 20 minutes. I knew what his van looked like at this point, and so I kept an eye out for it in case he was going to follow me home, but I didn't see anything. I actually ended up going back to the mall and returned the boots and scarf. In reality, I didn't want either of them, and I was way too uncomfortable accepting those gifts from a strange person. I don't like owing people, and I had a feeling he was going to use that as some sort of leverage to get something from me. I took the long way home to make sure I wasn't being followed, and told my mom about what happened. My mom was concerned and thought it was strange as well, since he and I didn't really know each other, and it seemed like a weird act of desperation. I got a text from him a few hours later saying he hoped I liked the gifts. I responded saying that I returned them because I wasn't comfortable with it and he lost it. My phone kept lighting up with tons of text messages. This was before it was easy to block someone, and I didn't know how to. Ah, the old flip phone. And he was livid that I did such a disrespectful thing. I should be thankful he got those things for me, etc. That's what he said. So I got angry and told him I didn't ask him for the gifts. He basically threatened me to keep them, and he didn't take no for an answer when I told him I didn't want them. So essentially, he was the one who disrespected me. He backed down a lot then. I told him to stop texting me and to leave me alone. I got a few more text messages, but eventually, he stopped. It was weird at school because I kind of avoided being around my friends when I knew he was there. I still hung out with some of them alone, like my best friend, but when I knew a friend gathering was going on, I wouldn't go, and they understood. Now this is where I got stupid. I'm a very very compassionate person, and 9 out of 10 times feel horrible for when I was mean to someone, even in this instance. I ended up texting the creeper one night apologizing for how rude I was to him, and he said he understood where I was coming from, and we had a normal conversation for a little bit, until I fell asleep around 11pm. I know this because I woke up at 2am, looked at my phone, and saw the last text I sent him was a little before 11 stating that I was tired. After I fell asleep, he sent me one text, so I didn't respond, texted again, so I didn't respond, kept texting. We're talking on the verge of like 30 to 40 text messages here, called me from his cell phone about 10 times, called me from another number about 15 times, because he thought I was ignoring him, and then sent one last threatening message. If you don't respond within half an hour, I'm calling the police. I happened to wake up at 2am, which was an hour after he sent that text message and flipped out, texting him that I fell asleep and he better have not called the police. Now you want to know why he called the police? 
it's because he thought me saying I was tired was me actually saying I was tired of living. He thought I killed myself. Never mind that it was, you know, basically bedtime when he and I were talking. So yes, me ending it all is the most logical route to take here. I ran into my mom's room, told her what happened, and she goes, For crying out loud, they had better things to do with their time. They aren't coming to check on you. I go back into my room, which looked out to our driveway, look out the window, see a cop car parked on the street, and two flashlights walking up the drive. They knock on the door. I opened it, and I'm pretty sure the look on my face told them everything. Are you Sally? Yeah. You know why we're here, right? Yeah. So, what happened? I fell asleep. The police understood and actually called the creep back and told him to leave me alone, just as I was texting him to leave me the hell alone. He then had the gall to ask for my address again. He had done this numerous times before, so he could come over and apologize to me and that he loved me. I told him he doesn't even know me and he had absolutely no reason to be in love with me at all. His reasoning was that's how he worked. He fell in love first and then decided if it was the right person or not. Dude was seriously loony. This put a really big strain on my friendships at the college. His story was much more twisted and painted me as the bad guy and I ended up making a lot of enemies, even with my best friend, because he labeled me as a whore. There was another guy interested in me as well among those friends, but he was much less assertive and I didn't give him the time of day, and everyone believed him, even though at the time I was still a virgin. I had to drop out of school because that circle of friends was so big, and whenever the creep saw me, he would get irrationally angry, and his friends had to physically hold him back, which was a lot of people because he was massive. I since cut contact with all of them, and I ended up going to a different school that I loved so much more and I'm in a much better place without all of them in my life. So, creep from school, I hope I never have to see you ever again. This is going to be a pretty tame story in comparison to a lot of the great stories I've read here before, but since it happened to me, I think it's pretty spooky. I'm definitely buying a doorbell camera ASAP. I'm writing this only a few hours after everything happened, now that I've calmed down a bit and the sun is coming up and I feel somewhat safer. Last night, I was laying in bed, reading a little bit before I went to sleep. I think it's important to clarify that I live on the outskirts of my town, still in town but definitely on the edge, off the highway that leads out of town and into about a 15 mile long stretch of lots of country, woods, fields, a few residences, but mostly open highway. So other than the other tenants in my actual apartment building, it's normally very quiet in my area. My building is a square with four apartments, and for each of us, our door simply faces out into the open. There's no lobby or foyer or anything. My door in particular looks out into a large field that goes up a hill. I don't remember the exact time, but sometime between 1 and 2 a.m., someone randomly started banging on my door which freaks me out at the best of times in broad daylight, but especially in the middle of the night. I nervously went to ask who it was, and this guy with a deep voice claimed he was a police officer and that I needed to let him in. That's what he said. I needed to let him in, not that I needed to open the door. Luckily, I watch and listen to a lot of true crime stuff, so I got pretty suspicious really quickly. I just got near instant alarm bells because he couldn't tell me why I needed to let him in, what I supposedly did, and he never asked what my name was. He also didn't really sound like a cop, if you know what I mean. Obviously, I was feeling creeped out, so I dialed 911 to confirm that there was actually an officer at my address, and they said that there wasn't. At this point, I'm freaking out, and I kind of call out through the door that I'm on the phone with the police, and the guy just kind of bangs on my door one more time and then stops making noise. I presume because he ran off at this point. They dispatched two cars to my apartment, and the officers took a good look around, but unfortunately the guy was now long gone by the time they got there, and I never saw him, so I don't have a description of him or anything. But the cops said two things to make me feel better. One, 
they'd post more patrols in my area over Halloween weekend, and two, it was most likely a Halloween prank because the bar down the street from my apartment had a party and it just closed not too long before. Always trust your instincts, and remember that if you have any doubts about someone claiming to be a police officer, call 911 and confirm they are who they say they are. Dispatch and the officers who came tonight told me you will not get in trouble for making sure the person talking to you is actually an officer. This also applies to situations where it's nighttime and dark, so you can't really see for sure if it's a real cop car behind you or not. If you see flashing lights behind you in a back road or a dark area at night, put on your hazard lights and call 911 first to make sure it's actually a police officer. You won't get in trouble. Better safe than sorry. Anyway, I hoped that anonymous guy was merely a drunken Halloween prankster and not someone who had sinister intentions. Whoever you are, let's not meet. This took place a while ago. I was 13 and my family had just moved to a new town. A new friend of mine from school and I made plans to go trick-or-treating together. At the time, I remember thinking I was a bit too old to still be trick-or-treating, but who doesn't want free candy, am I right? My friend and I figured we still had one year of trick-or-treating left in us. Because we're 13 and lived in a fairly safe neighborhood, my parents thought it was fine for us to trick-or-treat together without any sort of adult supervision. Everything was going great, and we were having fun, getting some solid candy, etc. Then we rang on one guy's doorbell. The porch light was on, and there was a pumpkin or two, so we figured the people in the house were likely to be handing out candy. A middle-aged man opened the door. At first I was glad because he was dressed in costume and happy to see my friend and me, so I felt we were in for some top-tier candy. I don't even remember what candy he handed out, but I do remember what happened next. He asked us to enter into his home, which is weird, but we're 13, so we didn't really think anything of it. Then he asked if he could take our photo. He said he always liked to take photos of the kids every Halloween because he loved seeing the costumes. On one of his walls were a bunch of pictures of different random unrelated children in Halloween costumes. At this point, even being a dumb 13-year-old, I was starting to get kind of creeped out but I figured it was best for us not to upset the man and let him take the picture regardless, and then we could leave. So he snaps the photo of us, and then he pulls out a clipboard with a sheet of paper on it, which has a bunch of names written in childish handwriting. He says he likes the kids who pictures he snaps to sign their names so he can know who they are. At this point, we're too conditioned not to be rude. I decided to sign a fake name. He looked at the paper, looked back up at me, then down at the paper, and then he repeated the fake name I'd given and nodded. Luckily after that he didn't do anything and we were free to leave, but it definitely creeped us both out. At the time I thought he was just an eccentric guy, but as an adult looking back on the story, it seems much more sinister. I'm just so glad that nothing bad happened to us and hope nothing bad happened to any other kids. Halloween, with all these costume kids trick-or-treating in the dark, as well as minimal parental supervision, could be a great opportunity for predators to get kids alone in their homes with no one knowing the kids' whereabouts. Anyway, please stay safe out there, and happy Halloween. This is my first post on this subreddit, so I apologize for this being all over the place. I'll try to remember what happened to the best of my ability. So to start, I, female, I was 13 at the time, was going out with a few friends for Halloween. This was a tradition that stopped after that night, but we would all get together and go out and have a good time, and then we would head to one of our houses to watch horror movies until sunrise the next morning. For some stupid reason, the six of us decided to split up. So Sarah, I'm not using their real names, and Alex went the one way toward Sarah's house because she was tired. Alice and Jessica went to head towards some more houses to stop at before meeting up with us again, and Rachel and I went off in the opposite direction towards the school. Rachel told me she wasn't feeling good and that she wanted to head back to Alice's place, so she went back towards Alice's house, leaving me alone. It was around 10 at night and I was getting cold, so I thought it was a good idea to cut through the park to go to Alice's house, 
We had decided beforehand to meet back at her house once we were all done. As I was getting close to the park, I could hear some boys laughing about something. I thought it was nothing, so I just ignored them. When I got to the walkway, I saw about four boys standing in the park. One clearly had something in his hand. I couldn't tell what it was, and I started walking faster to pass them. They all started walking to the path, and now blocked me. For reference, I went as Amy Lee. So I had a short, poofy, strapless dress on and high heels. There was no way I was going to outrun them. They started saying things like, Hey sexy, where are you off to? Why didn't you come say hi to us? What's a girl like you doing out here so late? I gave short answers and tried backing away. I don't really remember how I got away, but I'm pretty sure it's because I sacked one of them. I remember running like hell in my terrible heels back to Alice's place. When I got there, all the other girls were now crying. Alice had already gone home, but Alice, Jessica, and Rachel were on Alice's front lawn and asked me if I saw those guys in the park. Alice and Jessica dressed as boys for that year, and apparently those guys tried to fight them. Then when they figured out they were girls, they were grabbing at them and making comments. They got away because Alice held her phone up telling them she was calling the cops. We decided that we weren't going to go out for Halloween after that, and eventually we all stopped talking. But before that, we never talked about that night to anyone. So guys that were probably going to rape me and my old friends, please, let's never meet again. This happened to me in West Hollywood, Los Angeles, in 2015. I had just left a Halloween party, and I was dressed as Beetlejuice. An Uber dropped me off at my house, Curson and Melrose for anyone familiar with the area, and I started to wander around looking for a food truck. I had seen them before, and I didn't really feel nervous walking around as a woman at night by myself, because it's not exactly an abandoned area, and it's not known for its crime. I figured I'd find something within a few minutes and be on my way home. Plus, I'd only had one or two drinks, nothing to really take my level of alertness down. The problem occurred when I decided to walk between avenues. I wasn't having any luck on Melrose, so I decided to walk north down a residential block to get to another avenue where I'd have more luck. I remember I really wanted to listen to music, so first mistake, I was looking down at my phone queuing up a song to play aloud without headphones while I walked. I didn't realize that a man was running up behind me at full speed until he was almost on top of me. Two things happened at once. I realized there was a person literally sprinting at me, and right as I stepped out of the way, he tripped over some fallen palm leaves that weren't visible in the darkness. He stumbled, but didn't fall, and I said something like, Are you okay? But he didn't reply. He just kept on running at full speed until he reached the corner and turned left out of my sight. I immediately felt that what had happened was very, very sinister. Looking around, there was no one behind him or in front of him, no friends or something who dared him to pull some sort of prank, and I got enough of a look at his clothes that he wasn't in running gear. Even if he had been, why would he be out at 1am alone, running at full speed? He legitimately would have slammed into me if I hadn't stepped out of the way at the last second. I can't help but think that something terrible would have happened if I hadn't hurt his feet or he hadn't tripped on the leaves. What do you guys think? This is actually a true story and it just happened and I'm typing this out because I need to process just how insane it was. Names have been changed for obvious reasons. We had a Halloween party this year. It ran pretty late, and the last few people were leaving around 3am. I myself was chilling out front, and a dude no one knew was sweeping up the cans and cigarettes everyone left outside. We live in the city, so this isn't uncommon. He wasn't homeless, but he was clearly down on his luck and looking for tips. I didn't have any cash on myself, but my roommate Mike ran inside to grab some change for him. It ended up only being literal change, but I hung out and offered him a cigarette and chatted with him for a bit. He told me he was pretty much on his last chance. It's hard to get job on parole. He's just doing whatever he can. He told me that not too long ago, someone working at a pizza shop said he could sweep their sidewalk and all they gave him was a quarter and a soda for his efforts. 
a quarter, and a soda. Everyone else was gone, just me and sidewalk dude, so I go up to bed. I'm still pretty hyped from the party, so I'm just laying in bed on my phone for a while. About 30 minutes later, I hear a voice inside my house, downstairs. Mike, you got the soda? I went downstairs immediately and saw that the door from our kitchen to our mudroom was closed. There is a door from the mudroom to outside. No one ever closes the mudroom door. It is never closed. I went upstairs to get back up, walked to the mudroom door, and said I was going to open it and that they can just leave. Eventually, I got the courage up to open it, and no one was there, but the door to the outside was wide open, closed, locked, went to the front door, made sure it was locked. When I jiggled the doorknob, I heard sidewalk guy say, still here, just sitting outside. I don't know what would have happened had I not heard him, but the reason this freaked me out so badly was that he said, Mike, you got the soda? After telling me a story about a crappy person asking him to sweep and giving him a quarter and a soda, when Mike had just given him change, also because he was in my house. Okay, this happened to me about three years ago. It was brought up recently with my friends, and they suggested that I post it here. I have gone through therapy for this and trained in firearms because this was the creepiest night of my entire life. I spent a night in what felt like a horror movie, and it's still so vivid. It was a Wednesday night in the summertime. I was off of work. My husband was out of town, and our son was staying at his grandma's for the night. I was home alone with my dogs, an 80-pound Aussie mix, and my 80-pound German Shepherd slash Pit Bull mix. I've always had issues sleeping when I'm home alone, so I tend to just binge watch television in the living room until I can't keep my eyes open anymore. This particular night, I remembered that the trash pickup comes the next day, so I decided to turn on Game of Thrones for a bit, and then I would take the trash out. But all of a sudden, I realize it's 1.30am, and I still haven't taken the trash to the curb. My house has two solid iron gates, one in the front, and one to the side door slash backyard. The lighting on our street, or anywhere in our neighborhood, isn't that great. But it's a great neighborhood with lots of families, and you rarely hear about any crime here. I looked out the window by habit before I took the trash out, and saw who I thought was my neighbor smoking a cigarette outside of his gate across the street, looking directly at me. For context, this is a normal occurrence. My neighbor across the street hides smoking cigarettes from his wife, so he typically does it late at night in front of his gate. I get off of work late. So I usually see him and we wave, say hi, chat a little bit. Then I go inside and he makes the joke, you didn't see me smoking if my wife asks. So unbothered by seeing the guy, I go outside, grab my trash cans, open my squeaky iron gate, and take them out to the curb. I did not have my glasses on at the time, so as usual I waved and said hello. However, the guy, who I thought was my neighbor, threw down the cigarette and quickly walked off down the street. It took a minute for me to register that he was not my neighbor. I was a little bit creeped out because he was clearly staring into my window from the opposite sidewalk. But also, maybe it was a guy taking a night walk, not unusual in our neighborhood, and he just so happened to stop for a cigarette. I thought I probably weirded him out as much as he weirded me out. So I went back inside and laid on the couch with my dogs to keep watching Game of Thrones. At some point, I fell asleep and woke up hearing my gate squeak and my German Shepherd mix growling. He's extremely protective of our family at home, but he's also the kind of dog you can take anywhere because he's so friendly in public. My Aussie mix is more passive, but his sheer size and scary bark tends to deter people. He's very friendly, however. I quickly got up and pulled back my curtain. My gate was still shut and I didn't see anything. My dog, however, continued to growl at my front door. I looked out another window, which had a better view of my front yard and porch, but I didn't see anything. Eventually, my dog settled back down with my other dog, but I myself was still very uneasy, so I ended up watching TV again because I couldn't go back to sleep. About an hour later, I definitely heard my gate squeak, 
We are the only ones with a heavy cast iron gate, and the noise it makes is so distinct. So I look out the curtain, while my dogs are continuing to softly growl. My gate is halfway open, but I don't see anyone. At this point, I'm panicking. In my panic, I couldn't find my phone, so I grabbed my wooden baseball bat out of our room, crouched down, and started going through the couch cushions to get my phone. My dogs are oddly still quietly growling instead of barking, so I assume that nobody was there. The minute I find my phone, my front door handle starts shaking. I run to the side door to let my German Shepherd mix out. I know he'll protect me and he can jump the six foot back gate. My Aussie mix, going crazy, busts out one of our door's side lights. I then heard the guy say, oh shit, and immediately I let out my GSD mix. I jumped up to look out the window, saw my dog latch on the guy's hand. The guy starts screaming and takes off down the street, my dog chasing him. I then become terrified he's going to hurt my dog. So I run out with my baseball bat, screaming my dog's name over and over again. The next thing I know, my dog is prancing down the street back to me, happy as shit, with blood all over his face. I call the police, they took another hour or so to show up and didn't seem to take me too seriously. They did say they were going to call the local hospital, but I never heard back. I then called my husband bawling and he got on the next flight home. I stayed at his mom's for a few days, too terrified to go home, and I did buy my dog's giant ribeyes for being so good and for saving me as well. I don't know what the guy wanted, but since then I've been trained in firearms and self-defense. So creepy guy, Let's not meet, because my dog might finish the job that he started. So, after crying just a little bit after looking at crime scenes on the internet, I think it might be time to tell this story. It's just one of those moments when I randomly start thinking about it in more serious of a mood than usual. It's gonna be long. So this happened about four months ago now. Maybe more, but I really don't know for sure. Anyway, I was 19 years old. I've turned 20 years old now, mid-February, and I was going home from university after classes. I usually take my keys with me, but around that time I had lost them, and my mom was yet to take me to get a new copy. I remember I kept insisting, but she wouldn't listen, so what I did was knock on the door to get my younger brother's attention so he'd come back and let me in, but my mom also took his keys and just left him there locked up as well. I asked my brother to pass me my charger from my room and I called one of my aunties to see if I could go hang out at her workplace in the meantime. She said yes and then told me to call an Uber that she'd be paying for as soon as I got there and that's what I did. Now the Uber didn't pick me up exactly at home, it was in the house across the street instead no special reason, it just did. The moment I saw the guy, he gave me kind of a weird vibe but I also tend to be paranoid every time I so much as hop onto a taxi, so I just got in, rolled down the window, and kept a grip on both of my phones. It all seemed relatively normal, until we got to the area where my aunt's workplace was. This was a convenience store at her home in a housing, I think that's what you call it, when there's like a private division. I don't know, but condominium didn't sound right. He just completely drove past it and claimed he was following the GPS when I asked him about it, but he wouldn't let me see the GPS. He seemed to know exactly where he was going. Now, I was kind of doomed from the beginning because I don't know directions, and I could only rely on the driver being a decent person and recognizing the area, which I did. But wherever he was taking me, I had no idea. I remember seeing this fountain that I could recognize from when my mom drove to my uncle's place, but that was like way farther away from my aunt's place. By now, I was kind of thinking of what to do, because this guy drove past a ton of empty housings, and a couple of them even seemed to be still under construction. Then he stopped near a place that looked like the end of a civilization. We were literally on a hill, and then he turned off the car. I got lucky in so many ways however, looking back on it. My phone had no credit. As soon as I thought of that, my aunt called me and asked, 
where are you? And I literally felt my heart drop because I had no idea and this dude was just staring at me. I said I didn't know and asked him, hey, where did you take me? And he replied with, I wouldn't know what to tell you kid. That was enough for me. I grabbed my backpack and opened the door real quick with a loud, that's fine, I'll see myself out, and hauled ass like I hadn't in a very long time. I remember even being afraid of carrying my backpack on the back in case he chased me and pull on it so I was holding it in my hand with my hoodie wrapped around my waist as I thought of where to hide. I thought of knocking on someone's door, but for some reason that didn't seem safe to me at the moment. I remember telling my aunt not to hang up because he was still following me in the car. Then I saw an empty barren surrounded by concrete walls and a strong bar gate except there was enough space under the gate to crawl in, so I literally threw the backpack and then crawled under. There was a huge electric control box and I opened it to crouch inside and hide. My aunt still on the phone. She, my other aunt and my uncle, were all on a call with each other, putting credit on my phone and asking for my live location through WhatsApp because I had no idea where I was. Literally, I was in the middle of nowhere. I waited there for like two hours and this guy just wouldn't leave. I even had to go pee outside the box and immediately ran back inside. There were even tiny spiders and old honeycombs. So I was also fighting both arachnophobia and trypophobia. At some point, I'm guessing the guy left and my uncle got there in his truck. He didn't know where I was, so he kept honking and telling me to tell him when I could hear it closer. And then I finally did and got out. For a while I thought maybe this had been a misunderstanding and I just jumped out of some guy's car like a maniac without even paying him, but then when I got home after staying in my aunt's pharmacy for a while until my mom, who still didn't know much about what had happened, picked me up, I checked the Uber app and not only did it say I'd already paid, but it also said I made it to my destination, so I ruled that out. I told my aunts not to tell my mom because she goes insane at the minor inconvenience, so telling her this would only freak her out and she wouldn't be of any help. I only let her know when I called her to come get me and on her way to get a copy of that key because of course something bad had to happen until she actually listened to me and nowadays she always puts credit on my phone. Anyway, so that's what went down. I had to Indiana Jones that shit twice. And to this day, my family brags about how I was able to keep myself perfectly composed and react quickly as well, which I'm still shocked about. I remember seeing broken glass and metal bars laying around and telling my aunt, if I'm going down, I'm taking him with me, in a joking manner because, of course, her blood sugar levels were all over the place. On our way home, my mom told me I wasn't in hysterics because I was in shock and it was going to hit me the next day but it didn't. I kept going around as normal, but last week she brought it up again and asked if I didn't think I was going to die. I said of course, but that I also knew freaking out would only either make me easier of a target or just not help at all in any way. When I remember it, more than scared, I feel angry. I could have been one of the many, many girls who disappear and are later found dead on a random hill or ditch. I can't say I suffer survivor's guilt because, in all honesty, I don't, but I can't help but think, that could have been me, whenever another kid or teenager in the news is missing or is found dead. It really just could have gone terribly wrong. My parents believed that this guy was a rookie who maybe felt sorry for me, and so of course let me go, because if he really wanted to, he could have hurt me with some sort of weapon, or even try to kill me right then and there. I don't even know anymore. I sent his profile to all the girls I know so that if they ever happen to get him as an Uber driver, they can cancel. Since then, I don't take Ubers anymore. Anyway, wherever this guy is right now, I don't ever want to meet you again. When I first got out of college back in 2002, I worked the overnight shift at a Walgreens about a mile from my parents' house. Because it was overnight, we had a security guard. Usually it would only be the same person a few nights in a row, 
It tended to be people who had other jobs or hadn't slept in several days because of working so much. Then we got a regular security guard. At first he seemed fine and my supervisor and I liked having the security. Being a woman working the overnight shift alone on Long Island wasn't super dangerous, but enough that it was good to have a third person if one of us was on break. Then things started to get weird to say the least. When I would restock shelves, I would notice the security guard just staring at me, not for a minute or two, but once I watched him out of the corner of my eye as I reset and stocked the entire deodorant section, at least 30 minutes, not moving, just staring. This behavior went on for a few days, but I didn't really say anything about it because he wasn't coming anywhere near me. He would stare from the very end of the aisle. He would also disappear for an hour at a time several times a night. He didn't really talk to me or my boss, which was odd because all the other security guards had been at least somewhat talkative. At the beginning of a shift, his supervisor came in for some reason and was trying to find him. My boss said that he might be in the back. Apparently his supervisor found him asleep in the break room. While his supervisor was calling the company, the security guard grabbed his phone and got into a fight with him. He then started yelling and basically freaking out. The cops got called and the security guard had to be tackled and carried out of the store by about three cops. In order for this to happen though, my boss had to say to his face that he was no longer allowed in the store. He came back a few days later, specifically looking for my boss and I, and thankfully we were both off that day. After that we got pagers for something happened and the head of the security team came and hung out with us for the few days after the old security guard had come by. I felt much safer with the pagers. I never saw him again, and every night when I would be by myself on the floor, I would eye the door just in case he came back. I'm a frequent visitor of this subreddit, and I decided to share a story of something that happened to me years ago. Please excuse my English as English is not my first language. Several years ago, I was 19 years old, I'm female, and I'm studying in college. During exam period, I would always go to the public library in the city center to study. They would have special places for students to study. This particular day, I had went there with a classmate. It was a weekday and I finished studying at about 2 p.m. I asked my classmate if she would mind if I left. She said no, so I packed my stuff and left the library. As I walked out of the library, I went straight into the city center. As I left, I felt something brush up against me, considering I just walked out of the quiet library and into the crowded street. I just brushed it off. I proceeded to walk through the center to get to my bus stop, and after about five minutes of walking, I couldn't seem to shake the feeling that something was too close to me, so I grabbed my phone held it up, and looked into the screen to see if there's someone behind me, and that's when I saw this man, about 40 years old, walking behind me with his eyes set onto me. I felt uncomfortable because he was giving me weird vibes. He just looked off. He was walking with a limp while staring right at me. He was wearing a scarf with a suit jacket, really old track pants, and old gym shoes. I didn't think he was homeless or a junkie. He was just weird, but to be safe I put my phone in my bag and put the bag over my other shoulder and away from him. That's when he walked up to me and started walking next to me. At this point I've been walking for about 10 minutes through the busy streets. He kept his eyes on me and was walking so close as if me and him were walking together. Once I almost made it to the bus stop, I saw my bus then drive off. I didn't want to wait for another bus at the bus stop and I have this man wait with me or know which bus I'm taking, so I decided to continue walking to the central station, which was about 8 minutes away. As I crossed the street, I noticed the man kept walking and didn't cross the street. I felt relieved and pulled out my phone to text my mom that some weirdo had been following me for about 15 minutes at that point. Not even a minute later. This man comes running out of an alleyway right in front of me. I almost tripped when I saw him and he kept walking in front of me. Every 10 seconds, literally I counted, 
he would abruptly turn his head back to look at me. I had even made a small Snapchat video of it as well. At this point, I was so nervous, but I was almost at the central station, so I just kept going. That's when he stopped, turned around, and started talking to me. I saw you at the library, he said. I didn't respond. We were together at the library, he repeated. Again, I ignored him. He didn't get the hint and just kept talking. Hey, where are you going? Are you going to the central station? I'm going there. I'm taking X bus. Which bus are you taking? At this point, I had enough. There were people walking by and nobody said anything. So I just ran straight to the central station and got on my bus. I sat behind the bus driver just in case this creep decided to run after me. I saw him looking around before getting on his bus. Once I was on my bus, I finally had a moment to think about what happened, and I realized that this man had been sitting there at the library, watching me for hours, and watching me leave to go after me. I remember feeling uneasy all the time, but I ignored the feeling, thinking it was just nerves before the exams that were coming up. This experience really made me uncomfortable because I've been coming to this library to study for many years. Even in high school, I would study there till 9 p.m. and leave by myself in the darkness. I can only imagine what would have happened if I had met him then. So, psycho library stalker, let's not meet again. For context, I'm a 24-year-old female. This happened at my previous job, and it's a bit long. Howard was a senior in my team. One day during chit chat, he asked me to recommend some colognes to him as I know a lot about perfumes and fragrances. I recommended some and then he asked me to help buy it. I suggested it's better to try it out in person before buying for colognes, but he insisted many times that I buy my recommendation for him. So I did eventually. After I bought it, I WhatsApp him the receipt. He texted back, Thanks, I'll treat it as a gift from you, lol. He did pay me back later, so I thought he's just making a joke. The manager of my previous team, Alfred, asked me to go grab a drink after work another day as he noticed I was frustrated at work lately. He also said I could invite more people if I wanted to. So I invited Kate, my closest friend in the company who also was in Alfred's team. Kate suggested me to invite one more colleague. She believed it was better to hang out in a group of four. I think for a bit, and so I invited Howard, as he had worked under Alfred before. I told Howard that Alfred wanted to buy all of his drinks. I have drinks with Kate and another colleague Aiden together regularly after work, so that was the first time I hang out with either Alfred or Howard. After the drinks, we decided to take the last scheduled subway home. Only Howard and I live in the same direction. I knew he lived near Stop A from previous chit chat, which is 10 stops before mine. I actually live quite far away from the subway station, an hour walking distance, so I planned to take a taxi after getting off at my stop. After we got on the subway, Howard started to say things that made me uncomfortable. For instance, he asked when he could become as close to me as Aiden, or whether Aiden had ever been to my apartment. To be honest, I wasn't even that close with Aiden and we were more like work friends. I was annoyed by all those questions, but I thought to myself it's just a few more stops till stop A and I'll have peace soon. Howard didn't get off at stop A. I asked him about it, to which he replied he had some errands near stop B tomorrow morning, so he'd be staying at a friend's near stop B. Stop B is just one more stop before mine. Luckily, Howard shut up soon, probably because of my lack of response, so I just looked at my phone in silence. I just noticed Howard was still there when I was about to get off at my stop. He followed me off the subway and offered to take a taxi together. He said he'd drop me off at my place and then go to his friend's place, which would make no sense as these two drop-off points are in complete opposite directions at my subway stop. So I decided by saying I planned to walk home. He didn't know where I live. Then he offered to walk me home. I said it's an hour away and persuaded him to just get a taxi outside my subway stop. He finally budged and called a taxi through the app, which shows the estimated fare. 
I overheard him murmuring the amount, which was definitely more than traveling from my subway stop to stop B, more like traveling to stop A. I suspected this stay at his friend thing was a lie all along, so he could just follow me home. A week later, Kate told me she overheard Howard insinuating to Alfred that we were in a relationship. We were in a profession where relationships between staff are required to be reported, and spouses cannot work in the same team. I was crept out by Howard but didn't bring it up to Alfred, as he didn't ask me about it either. A month later, Alfred invited his team and a lot of other people he previously worked with to dinner to celebrate the end of a project. After the meal, Alfred asked me where I was heading to, as he knew I have two apartments. Kate and Howard were walking with us. I told Alfred I'm going back to the apartment in the same direction of Kate's, which was in the opposite direction as Howard's. Howard joined in the conversation and said he's going to that direction too, as a friend was hosting a party there. Kate and I were doubtful, surely. On the subway, Kate asked him where was the party, and Howard replied, Stop C. So Kate and I pretended we had other places to hang out at, and I was not getting off at Stop C. Howard got off at Stop C eventually, and I rode with Kate to her stop, and then got on another subway back to Stop C. I avoided him as much as possible before I could quit my job since then. Okay, so this is long, but there is a lot of information. So my mom is newly widowed, October, and had been with my dad for 48 years. She still looks great, is classy, has always been faithful to my dad, and because of this has always had a line of guys interested in her, including this one. I'll call him Todd. Todd has known her and my dad for years through a local watering hole they all went to, not together, and were very friendly from there. He finds out that my dad passed away recently. So a month ago, Todd starts showing up to my mom's work. She works at a local store as a cake decorator. He initially comes in and talks to her, which isn't actually out of the ordinary. She has many customers who come talk to her regularly. This time Todd says some things that let us know he has been looking for information about her online. He first says, you're 65, and she says, yeah, kind of confused why he's saying it. He then says, you were born on such and such date, and she says, yeah, still confused. Then he says her phone number. From then on, he began contacting her, a lot. She didn't think much of it at first, even though those are major red flags in my opinion. Todd starts coming to her work more regularly, calling and saying, not asking, to come over too. She would say no, but he would still show up and be super pushy about things. When he would show up, she would let him in but say fine, but you can only stay half an hour, etc. He would come in, they would talk and sometimes have a drink, and she would tell him it's time to leave. This continues for a few weeks, and then I come home to visit. My mom hadn't even told me about him before this. Then she comes home from work one day and is noticeably worked up. She says she has a friend coming over and it's a guy. I laugh and say, Mom, it's fine. I know my dad would have been okay with it and wouldn't have wanted her to wait. He would want her to find someone and be happy. She says they aren't dating or anything, but warns me that the guy often acts like they are a couple, even though they're not. So Todd comes over, and sure enough, he does just that. I'm confused initially by the way he's acting. It seems like they've been dating for a few months, and I'm wondering if my mom was just afraid to tell me. She's acting weird, but I can't put my finger on it. She keeps saying in front of him that he acts like they are a couple, even though they're not. He just laughs it off and tries to grab her hand or put his hand on her leg. And then she goes into another room and he tells me how nervous he was to meet me. He starts crying and I think for a moment he's going to ask if it's okay to propose because he's so serious and going on and on about how much she means to him. He tells me that my mom was sobbing to him as he hugged her and that she just sank into him. It was creepy as all hell. Of course she's going to be sobbing because her husband of 48 years just passed away and my dad adored her. He also makes some alarming comments like saying, my mom spends too much money. She doesn't and really hasn't had a whole lot her whole life, but she is better off financially than when my dad was here because of a few different things. My parents only recently, 
as within the last five years, purchased their first house. He also tells her privately that she's not allowed to go out with my daughter and I that weekend. I find this out later. Needless to say, I'm not feeling good about him, and I'm lost at this point, and I'm fuming because I don't know when all this took place. I also need to add that Todd used to work with my husband. I wouldn't have even known, as I didn't initially recognize the name, but my mom mentioned it to me, so I called to ask him about the guy, not even telling him why at first, and he instantly tells me he is a snake in the grass, untrustworthy, manipulative, and vindictive. He goes on to tell me the guy was fired for stealing company time and reminds me that he has told me about him before. About 15 years ago, Todd told my husband at work that Todd would be married to my mom if it wasn't for my dad. I then remember the conversation and about how we all laughed about and joked about it back then. I'm also very concerned at this point because I realize he had this obsession with her for over 15 years now so I don't address it with my mom that night because I want to collect my thoughts and don't want to hurt her feelings. The next day, she has a hair appointment and Todd had heard us talking about it. I come back from the store and Todd's vehicle is in the driveway. I'm not happy at all about it. I go in and he's there talking and standing with her in the kitchen. She then tells me right away that he just stopped to see her hair real quick. I find out later he just showed up without calling. He also kept asking questions and seemed a little too interested in our St. Patrick's Day plans that first night. We were going to meet up with my grandpa and go out for a bit as we're Irish and it's a big deal in our family. I could see he was taking mental notes of what we were saying when we talked about it, so it wasn't surprising when he brought it up the next day at my mom's. I made it a point to barely say anything and he left a few minutes later. He leaves and I tell my mom right away that he's not messing around he's not coming with us the next day. She immediately says okay and that she doesn't even really like him that much, so she's fine with it, to my relief. Then he knocks at the door again and walks in and says he has left the phone there. And my mom says he couldn't have left it anywhere but the kitchen because they didn't even go anywhere else in the house. But he makes a weird point of saying it must be on the couch when they were in there and sure enough it's there, even though my mom swears they didn't go in there but they are right next to each other, and he easily could have said it there real quickly while talking to her. I almost felt as though he was listening outside, but I can't be too sure. So he leaves, and I explained to her what my husband had said. My husband was very concerned, to the point he said we needed to contact her work, because Todd would try to get her fired as well as contact the police and let the neighbors know. I am very concerned for her safety at this point. She trusts my husband with her life, so she takes it very seriously and says okay. She goes on to tell me how she had only been talking to him for a few weeks and that he kept stopping by even though she would tell him not to. She did kind of like him but wasn't really invested or anything like that and I think honestly just liked having someone to talk to. She tells me that he was going through a divorce but they hadn't finalized it because he was still on her insurance. I get that, but then he tells her that he just went to a lawyer to finally get it done. She tells him, well I hope that isn't because of me or anything, and he tells her, well I already paid 5000 to the lawyer and makes her feel obligated to him. I also find out from my uncle that he had a run in with him. The very first week they were talking, Todd got my mom some tires for her car. She paid for them, he just picked them up. He drops them off and my uncle is shoveling the snow in her driveway. Todd comes up and doesn't even say hi or ask him who he is, but he just says, How old are you? In a weird way. My uncle tells him and explains how he is related. Todd doesn't respond and walks off into the house. When he comes back out, my uncle says, Thanks again for doing that for her. We really appreciate it. Todd doesn't even acknowledge him and just gives him dirty looks like he's jealous. I also find out that Todd told my mom some ridiculous story about my dad offering to do drugs with him at the bar, knowing my mom is against that kind of thing, and she obviously can't question my dad. It is like he is competitive with my dad who isn't even here, and it infuriates me that he would badmouth him and say something that I know isn't true. So that brings us to St. Patrick's Day. Todd shows up to her work again and just says, give me your keys. I'm going to wash your car. 
My mom says, no, you can't take my car. He has never even drove it before. He is just this pushy and presumptuous. She tells him he can't go with him that night. He can't come over anymore and can't call. She goes on to explain that we don't think he is good for her, that my husband is concerned and that she wholeheartedly trusts him so that he's not to contact her anymore. She calls to tell me this and while I'm on the phone with her, I then start hearing someone pounding at the door. It is him, I find out, but I don't answer. Now I'm not sure how it was even possible to get there that fast. He knocks for 15 minutes and then leaves a note in the door for me to call him. I don't call but text and tell him I got the note, but don't feel we need to have a phone conversation about anything. I tell him my mom explained the situation already. She doesn't want to see him anymore and he needs to respect that. He then responds by saying he deserves to know who said what. I tell him that's not necessary and we would have felt the same based on our interaction with him. I failed to mention earlier, my daughter was also there when we met and realized she knew him. She was the main bartender for a year at the bar he frequents and she hated him. He constantly tried to tell her how to do her job. When he met her, he tried acting like he didn't know her at first. He then pleads with me to speak to him on the phone and I say it's not a back and forth discussion and he needs to respect it. He then goes on and says he thinks it's all BS and that no one said anything at all. I tell him I will do everything in my power to make sure he stays away at this point, that we have notified her work, neighbors, and the police. He continues the call that night. We have not heard from him since then directly, but he sent a mutual friend to my mom's work to let her know that Todd said he won't bother her anymore, but that if she wanted to call him in a few weeks after everyone settled down, that she could. This worries me that he's still holding out hope. It also worries me about what will happen when I leave tomorrow. He knows I'm leaving tomorrow as well.